Obviously, abortion is dominating the news cycle as more and more states pass legislation that would prevent women from being able to undergo the procedure at their convenience. And I just have five questions for people that during all of this have remained pro-abortion. So stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. In recent conversations that I've been having with people about abortion, one thing that I've always been asked is, well, what would happen if you got a girl pregnant right now? Would you still be pro-life then? And I think that this question is dishonest. I also think it's fairly common, especially for young people that believe in the right to life of children in the womb. And I really despise that question because... And this is where the leftist keyboard warriors chime in. Doyle refuses to answer the question. Doyle, he's dodging the question. It's like, in the video I posted refuting all the pro-abortion arguments that I could find when I finally got to the burning building hypothetical. And I guess I didn't answer the question. Uh, that's not because, you know, it would have defeated me with facts and logic. It's like I honestly thought that we could all just establish a consensus that the question was dumb because it does not prove the point that the guy thinks that it does. Would I save a five-year-old boy or a box of a thousand human embryos? The five-year-old boy. But just because I would save the boy does not mean that the lives of the embryos don't have value. The conclusion that he was drawing from this, this hypothetical, is that because everyone would opt to save the five-year-old, that the lives of the embryos therefore have no value because no one thinks that they're the same thing. This is a false dichotomy. That's why I offered an alternative hypothetical, which was just, what if it were just an embryo on the ground in front of you and you had to either step on it or not step on it? Does its life have value or does it not? And the thing is, yes, embryos are not the same as five-year-olds, but no one is claiming that they are in the first place. If a woman's life is in danger as a result of her pregnancy, say the baby starts to develop in the fallopian tube, uh, you will not find a single prominent pro-life activist that would argue that the woman's right to life has to end because of the pregnancy abnormality causing severe health problems. If the woman's life will end by having her see the pregnancy to term, the woman's life is prioritized. Obviously, especially because the baby likely would not have survived anyways. So here's the difference. A pregnancy being an explicit threat to your life is not the same as a pregnancy being inconvenient to your life. Not the same at all. Life begins at conception. You don't get to end a life because it's inconvenient to you. And they know that. Of course they know that. Everybody, everybody knows that. That's why they, you know, they manipulate the morality by citing statistical anomalies like rape, incest. But back to the pregnancy question. I despise that question for a few reasons. The first being it implies hypocrisy. They're suggesting that we're only pro-life until we decide that we don't want a child after said child has been conceived and then we'll be on our way to Planned Parenthood. And this is just so false. We're pro-life, period. It applies to all of us. That we accept that label. We know that when we accept the label. That leads us to the second part that I hate, like quite frankly, the ignorance of it. The ignorance of the question is that they assume that while we're pro-life on the surface, we aren't practicing abstinence or protected sex at the very least, basically that we have no sexual morality or temperance and therefore we're just as likely to want abortion access. And this is fundamentally untrue. And this is how I'm always, I'm forced to answer the question like this. I'm like, okay, well, a few things first, and they're like, no, yes or no, would you keep the child? And I have to be like, okay, well, assuming I was engaging in sexual intercourse outside the context of a committed relationship during which we were irresponsible enough to create a life that we were not emotionally or financially capable of supporting at this moment in our very young lives, then yes, I would keep it. <laughs> There's always more context to the discussion. And the answer will always be yes, but to someone that supports abortion, that's a dishonest answer because they don't seem to be able to comprehend the existence of lifestyles that avoid situations that would allow abortion to even be to even be argued for in the first place. You know, just don't like abortion, don't have one. Don't want kids, don't have sex. They're like, wait, no fair. And someone accused me, of, oh, that's appeal to nature. It's appeal to nature fallacy last time I made that argument, which is stupid. Appeal to nature would be if you got pregnant and I say, the pregnancy is inherently good because it's natural. I never claimed that it was good for you. In fact, most of what I've said is that it's been particularly inconvenient for you and I wish that you would have been more responsible, but your convenience does not trump someone else's right to life. The argument that you're trying to make against me is what I'm saying is, you know, a child has a right to life because it was created naturally. Therefore, my thinking is illogical because appeal to nature. No, it's a bit of a red herring. Uh, if that were a coherent argument, then no one would be able to rationalize their own right to life because since we're all created naturally, it's just appeal to nature. Give me a break. The child has a right to life because it is alive. I think that you could argue that in vitro fertilization isn't particularly natural, but that child still has a right to life. Well, but those are always planned. Again, it's not about convenience. It's about life. Your convenience is irrelevant. And honestly, the fact that you even think it's relevant in the first place, like that you bring up, well, it's inconvenient, it's incredibly narcissistic. Moving forward, so I've got five questions that I would like answered by uh, pro-abortion people in no particular order of importance. So my first question would be, do you not agree 
that the life in the womb is valid or is it that you don't even agree that it's a life? Is it that you acknowledge that what is inside of the womb is a life but you reject the validity of its right to be alive? Or you do, do you just not agree that it's a life in the first place, therefore it couldn't possibly have a right to be alive? The reason this question is important is because it narrows down the separation. If it's the former, that they don't recognize the validity of the life, or the latter, that they don't recognize that it's even a life in the first place. So abortion activists have actually largely moved away from arguing the latter because it would dictate that if we could biologically establish that what's growing inside of the woman is a life, then abortion would be immoral. And since it's fairly simple to establish that, it's not to their advantage to play that game. So they've shifted most of their strategy to pushing the argument that oh, abortions, it's right because it's what I want. It's my choice. And, you know, some might say, well, you know, abortion is wrong, but it's still a woman's choice. And then my question to those people would be, do you or do you not agree that the law ought to reflect the morality of the society? If the child is alive, then it has a right to life, and that takes precedence over your choice. If that child is alive, then its life is valid. That's objective. Progressivism, it's actually quite self-defeating in practice because here they are, they're trying to establish that the validity of life is relative, and that idea is supposed to be a progressive idea. You see, to make progress, we need to have objectivity. We need to be able to say we were objectively there, and now we are objectively here. Net gain equals progress, and when everything's relative, you can't do that. You can't objectively establish progress. The whole idea of it being a woman's choice mandates that the validity of life in the womb must be relative. If it were objectively existent or non-existent, you could either kill it or you could not kill it. Framing the argument as if each woman can decide whether or not her child's life is valid undermines the innate value of human life. A mother gets an ultrasound at eight weeks and cries tears of joy. Another mother gets an ultrasound at eight weeks and schedules an abortion appointment, which is wrong. Or is there no right or wrong? You know, it's, if it's their right to choose, therefore there's no objective morality? Gotcha. In my own experience, I have yet to speak with someone that would make the argument that the child is categorically not human. Obviously, it's a human. I would hope that we could all agree on that one. Uh, typically, things don't change their species during development, to my knowledge at least. From there, we have to ask, is it alive? Google has dead defined as no longer alive. Life is defined as the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter, including capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change preceding death, and then also the existence of an individual human being or animal. An unborn child isn't a sperm. It's not an egg. It's an individual human being. It's got its own genetic code. It has its own blood type. Just because it requires a certain environment to survive does not invalidate its life. If you're saying that because A, it requires specific circumstances in order to survive, then B, its life is not valid. We can test that argument though. We can't colonize the sun. Why not? Because we require specific circumstances to survive. According to your reasoning, our life is invalid, which I would hope that we both reject. So either you're wrong about B or you're wrong that it's A that justifies B, or you can accept that by arguing for B, you have justified A. That brings me to my next question, which is, is convenience a precedent that you are comfortable with establishing? Again, at least 85% of abortions on a national scale are for convenience. I've heard as high as 90% before, but we'll be conservative with the data here. To break out the letters again, if abortion is justified, A, because it's convenient to you, B, then you're arguing that B is a valid means to reach the ends of A. But this also means that B can be applied to reach conclusion C, D, whatever. Littering is more convenient than finding a trash can. Is it justified because it's more convenient to me? And I think that this really is the core of the issue for a lot of pro-choice people. They seem to ignore the validity of the life for their own convenience, and it's disturbing. We've seen this thinking before throughout history. The difference is, the slave owners at least had the decency to try to argue that the slaves weren't human. The abortion activists just tried to argue that the validity of life is subjective. The problem with that is that all of our rights and liberties are derivative of our inherent value as human beings. The moment that you entertain the idea of our value being subjective, you have sacrificed the reason for your own liberty. But is what is convenient always what is right or what we should do and perhaps you might not think so as a general rule but just this once because you want to be pro-choice but that's indicative of a major inconsistency within your own morality doing the right thing was never about convenience that's the whole reason it's a virtue that's the nobility of sacrifice that's why we're emotionally moved when we hear like from last summer victor mazqueda this 22 year old guy hiking alongside a river in sequoia national park five-year-old boy that he was not related to falls into an aggressive river, starts to drown, and apparently despite the fact that according to Victor's family that was there with him, Victor could not swim, Victor is the first one to jump right into the river to save the boy that he had never met before, and he's able to hand the boy over to his parents before he went under for the last time, and he drowned in that river. What does that mean? Victor had no relation to that child, no obligation to risk his life for that child, no obligation to inconvenience himself for that child, but he did it anyways, no hesitation. He couldn't even swim, didn't flinch, he just jumped right into that river. He was on a trip with his own family. He had his own interests, his own goals, his own hobbies. None of that mattered to him in that moment. Victor liked to play guitar. Think about that. Think about everything that makes you who you are, your favorite Christmas movie, your favorite 
holiday vacation spot, first time you skinned your knee, how you like to go through your nighttime routine, whether or not you like coffee. All of that is unique to you. Yeah, obviously, you know, everybody's special. It's cliche. Maybe you're not special. Maybe you're average. Maybe you're even below average. What does that even mean? I don't know. Everything about life, everything about this experience we have is special and it's valuable. There's value in being happy. There's value in being sad because that means that you cared enough about something for it to have affected you and that is beautiful. That is human. That's human life and it's all valuable and it's instinctual. Victor jumping in that river without hesitation, that's an instinctual recognition of the universal value of human life. He is a hero. It's not about what is easy. It's about what is right. That is the whole point. Next question. Will you concede if and when the legal precedent changes? Right now, the precedent is that women have a right to abortion access because it's encompassed by their right to privacy under the Ninth Amendment, as implied by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. And this was established in 1965 with Griswold versus Connecticut and then affirmed for abortion access in 1973 with Roe versus Wade. The reason I ask this is because oftentimes they bring up their right to an abortion and Granted, people that support abortion tend to classify most things that they want as rights, but regardless, is legal precedent the basis on which your belief rests? Not morality, but legal precedent? And if the precedent changes, will you adjust your beliefs? In Dred Scott v. Sanford in 1857, it was established that the United States could not outlaw slavery in its territories. Does this reflect morality? The case established that blacks had no rights and could be used as property. Is that okay, simply because the court said so? I think the abortion advocates have trouble arguing the morality of it, so they tend to backpedal into the it's a right argument, which is fine, because when that goes away, they will in theory have to be consistent in their support of our great constitution. Of course they won't, but still. If it's decided that the right to privacy, which for some reason includes abortion, is lesser than the right to the life of the child in the womb, I would hope that our constitutional scholars on the left would follow suit. My penultimate question is... Are there any circumstances in which you would be against abortion? Are you unfailingly pro-abortion or do circumstances exist that would compel you to reconsider? A lot of people that I've spoken with have said that they disagree with abortion, but it's not their choice to make or that they disagree unless it's for rape or incest. And that's true that it's not your choice to make, but is it the mother's choice to make? Is it even a choice that could be made, morally speaking? If you believe that it is wrong, you are obligated to speak up. Otherwise, you are complicit in immorality and you are a hypocrite. With cases of rape or incest, if you are against abortion in cases that are purely for convenience, it is because you recognize that life has value. And the value of that life takes precedence over the convenience of the mother. For you to then make exceptions for your morality in cases of rape or incest, that would require that you view that life as less valuable. Human life is infinitely valuable, so there is no circumstance where the inconvenience to the mother would outweigh the value of the life of that child if you support abortion in the first two trimesters, but not the third. Why? Why do you draw the line there? 60 to 70% of infants born after two trimesters survive, so why stop there? Does one week earlier, one week later really make a difference? I think what you'll find is that your line is arbitrarily drawn in order to reduce the anxiety that's caused by either aligning your public opinion with your morality or realizing the importance of human life that a significant proportion of our culture has seemed to ignore. Last question to the pro-choice people. What if you're wrong? What if you are wrong? What if what you support is actually murder, and not just murder, but the murder of the most vulnerable and innocent beings on the planet? If I'm wrong, okay, we have more people than we would have had otherwise. But if you're wrong, then hundreds of thousands of people are being killed in this country every year in the name of convenience or progressivism or your superficial right to choose, whatever your preferred coping rhetoric is. If you're wrong, if between consuming CNN and the Huffington Post, you've somehow miscalculated, do you acknowledge what that would mean for the state of humanity, for the value of human life and for your own morality? Perhaps the reason these people are so evangelically pro-abortion, the reason that they insist upon screaming how, no, they definitely don't regret it. In fact, they champion it. Maybe it's because they have to do that in order to prevent themselves from acknowledging the evil that they've bought into. It's definitely a hard position to be in for them. But understand that no one that's pro-life has any ill will in their hearts. We are pro-life because we care about the value of human life. That is it. We welcome anyone that believes in the value of human life. We hold no grievance towards people that used to support abortion or even towards women that have had abortions in the past. That's not our job. Our job is just to spread the message of the value of human life. With Memorial Day weekend too especially, um, thinking about that. I hope you guys had a good weekend. I tweeted out, you know, I wanted to know what you guys were up to. So I thought I would read those. So um, what do we got here? Liam is destroying libs. Attaway Liam. Uh, Doug is showing his American pride. Shashank is lowering the expectations of his parents. Jack, quite good. How about yours? The question was, what are you guys doing for Memorial Day weekend? Jack says, quite good. How about yours? Matt is pooping. Connor is celebrating his dad's 60th. Jay Lynn is having a barbecue. Oh my God. 
Imagine doing, imagine telling people not to thank veterans. Imagine being that person. Okay, I'm not, I'm not even gonna put up their Twitter information. I'm not gonna give them that attention. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and leave it a comment. You can also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Memorial Day weekend was a lot of fun. Spent some time with family, attended a wedding, as you can probably tell. This tie is busier than what I would usually wear. It's getting too hot to wear suits. It's getting too hot, I don't know. T-shirts are a move. Sweaters in the winter, you know, I don't know. We'll see, but thank you so much for watching. I hope you had a great weekend, and may God bless America.